Hi, my name's Joel Ashen and welcome to another episode of Wild Your Garden. And today I'm going to show you what this and that have to do with making a wildflower meadow. So you join me today in the depths of Norfolk where uh, I'm working on a piece of land that is surrounded almost 360 degrees uh, by woodland which is fabulous, absolutely gorgeous countryside uh, and there's a lot of birds out here, there's kestrels I keep hearing intermittently in the background, there's buzzards, red kites, uh, there's nut hatches been flying over, gold crests, coal tits, uh, because there is so much woodland around here and a lot of habitat for them. And interspersed with that, there is a, a series of streams and rivers. Uh, and right behind me, uh, up near the house, the, this old mill house that's been restored that I'm working on, uh, there's a fabulous river called the River Bure. Those of you that know your rivers, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, river that's full of trout and many other fish, but uh, we won't go into that today. However, my task with these bits of kit, which you've just seen here, is to create a wildflower meadow on part of the land. Now, the area behind me, as you can see, if I just spin round, is a bit of a dumping ground. It has been for, for the previous owners. There was a few concrete bases here, uh, and it was a bit of a utility area, it never really amounted to much. And, and particularly on the, the, the backside, right in the corner behind me is a lot of nettles, thistles, uh, and docks and things, which are indicators of fertile ground. Now. For those of you that know wildflower meadows prefer stonier more sort of calcareous or poorer soils to thrive because of course uh, if the ground is too fertile then your your bully species if you like your nettles your thistles your docks uh, will sort of take over the wildflowers now for those of you saying well hang on a minute nettles and thistles have their value for wildlife yes they do in moderation uh, but they can become a bit of a monoculture and i'll go and show you that now so looking back to where I was just stood over there, you can see this whole patch of nettles behind me, which is stretching off into the distance, uh, which again is fine and it'll hold a few uh, larval clusters of things like peacock butterfly, small tortoiseshell, uh, and a few of our Vanetti species found in the UK. However, it becomes a bit of a monoculture and not actually that great for wildlife on the whole and could be vastly improved. So. The thinking behind this project is to strip the existing uh, topsoil and turf off uh, and form a bank behind me just along the edge of these beautiful uh, willow trees which have been pollarded previously and provide some great cover for birds. Uh, but a bank sort of along this edge of the field and strip all the, like I say, the turf off and then get down to the poor subsoil layers uh, which will enable us to sow a wildflower mix into those poor soils and the wildflowers will stand a much better chance of thriving rather than just strimming all this down or cutting all this down, rotivating it and throwing wildflower seed on which you can unfortunately waste many thousands of pounds on wildflower seed and time and effort uh, for the nettles and everything to come back in time because that underlying fertility is still in the ground. So first things first, we've got to get the turf off. Oh, and one last thing before I get started. For those of you that are sat there thinking, well, this is great, but I don't have acres of land. I only have a small back garden and I would really love to create a wildflower meadow. I sure as heck I'm not going to get a bulldozer into my garden. You don't need to, of course. And I will be discussing how you can make wildflower meadows on a much smaller scale in other videos. So please feel free to subscribe to the channel and give the video a like and stay tuned and I'll be bringing you more videos on smaller meadows to come.
as you can see i'm part way through the stripping of the turf now and uh, i just wanted to show you some of the uh, <laughs> stuff that i'm dealing with this is remnants of the uh, old concrete bases and the old sheds that were here uh, previously so um yeah quite interesting you can see behind me the uh, the difference in height between the the top level and the bottom level where the soil is the amount of stuff that was piled in this area from uh, the previous owners you can see it's all full of concrete flint rubble all sorts i'm finding in here and um if we take a look now at what i'm pushing up uh, the heap into you can see uh, it's forming quite a heap which again i will go over of course with the bulldozer uh, and the digger just to get that a nice level but here you go look another another example down there a nice nice lump of concrete so um but that's fine i can lose all that in the bottom of the bank and this bank then will be a good opportunity to plant uh, and sow a different variety of wildflowers onto or particularly uh, more of a grass mixture so that this is almost left all year for voles and small mammals and things amphibians reptiles uh, as, a, as a bit of a tussock area so that it, they have somewhere through the winter time and of course the local kestrels that are uh, found uh, i've been seeing them today along the edge of the the woodland belt uh, it gives them a bit more habitat to hunt through um, so it's another good opportunity to create another habitat in here and of course with all this uh, sort of rubble as you can see behind me um, it's great for overwintering amphibians and things which of course will often overwinter in rubble sacks and underground partly as well so perfect for that but I just wanted to show you as well the um, the sort of the fertility you can see this darker richer topsoil which of course is the whole reason we've got these uh, nettles uh, through the uh, existing grassland but also docks you can see uh, these docks, which are another good indicator of uh, fertile ground. They do very well uh, in fertile soil. So, yeah, you can see there's still a bit left to go um, before I can then start shaping the bank, etc. So, I better get on with it. Just uh, another example here of the sort of stuff I'm finding uh, in this ground. As you can see, a hole, what looks like a roof joist, um, all sorts through here. Yeah, a bit of a pain, but there you go, that's part of the job. And again, not more blocks, but hey, <laughs> I guess they didn't want to get rid of any rubbish. All sorts of stuff, like plastic here, yeah man think people would want to get rid of this sort of thing have another look at this look. some pipe <laughs> whatever that was used for and um, obviously an old tin roof from something which again is uh, interesting to say the least so these sorts of items I probably won't be burying in the bank so I'll be pulling those out to one side anyway onwards and upwards
So I'm about two thirds of the way through mounding the banks now. You can just see the dozer behind me on top of the last bank that I'm shaping. Um, yesterday I finished off mounding the little mound over there and compacting it down and the same with that mound in the corner over there. So we've got a nice clear site now um, and it's looking pretty good. So now the last thing is this bank behind me, which you can see has still got these big chunks of rock and rubble and everything in them, but uh, they'll soon get compacted in. Uh, and once I've finished this bank, uh, it's then down to stripping the topsoil off the main part of the meadow or the rest of the topsoil and spreading it over the tops of these banks again, uh, just to remove that last little bit of fertility that may be in the ground to get down to those poor subsoil layers, which is going to be key to the uh, establishment of the wildflower meadow. So while the diesel's ticking away, I'll uh, get back up and get in the dozer and get this bank leveled off and finished off. And then of course we can start looking at the central part of the meadow and getting that down to the gold stuff, if you like, the subsoil that we need. Okay, see you soon.
Okay, so at long last, the banks now are completely, as you can see, compacted down. They've had the turf put underneath them, then a layer of topsoil over the middle, which acts as two things. One, to get a good seed bed on top of the banks, and two, to obviously remove the last of the topsoil from the middle area. As you can see, it's just uh, last hour of daylight now, um, just to try and get the middle of the site bladed off level, ready for rotivating to get that perfect tilth for the seeding. And um, yeah, I think we'll just about do it. The machines are going back tomorrow morning, so uh, it'll be a good job done. Uh, the excavator's done now, that's out of the site. And uh, we've just about, as you can see in this little bit of a hole behind me, uh, finished finding the last of the brickwork and the rubble and the concrete that was under this old uh, chicken shed or yard, if you like, where all the old buildings were. So uh, yeah, nearly there now. Last push just to get this bit of the, uh, the meadow leveled off and then we can get the bulldozer out and that's ready for collection tomorrow morning. So there's only one thing to do and that's get on with it. That's the last of the leveling done now with the bulldozer and as you can see we are bulldozer and digger free so uh, yeah they've just gone off the site so it's now time for the last in the process or well, last but one actually uh, the tractor as you can see behind me with the rotator on the back I'm just going to go over the middle of the site now uh, the banks that have been tracked over with the uh, bulldozer have actually got a really nice tilth on top uh, tilth just means you know nice crumbly soil uh, good for seeding or good for getting a seed bed into so uh, they're fine I just need to rake those once I've leveled this middle area off but the middle area is a bit compacted where the machinery has been running over it so uh, I'm going to go over that with the rotator now and it's got a roller on the back which will nicely compact the uh, soil to a reasonable amount back down again uh, which will be great for then putting the seed into uh, and then after that it's just a case of going over the banks with a rake just to get a really nice fine level on that so um, yeah hopefully I can get that done before any rain comes and it starts clogging up the ro rotivator so uh, yeah better get on with it Okay, so I'm about halfway through the rotivating of the main area now and as you can see the area behind me as as it was left with the bulldozer um, it's not too bad it's pretty level but of course you've got these compacted roots in the middle where the tracks were and I just wanted to show you the finish now 
as you can see this bit that I've done with the rotavator uh, which has done a fantastic job of just leveling out any bumps just you know getting a really nice finish and if I show you um, the soil now that it's been left in the wake is this lovely crumbly soil which will be great for getting a seed bed into or sown into so uh, yeah, halfway there as you can see that's looking really good now uh, it's just this other half of the site to do uh, and then one of, once I've done that it's a case of going over the banks as I said before and giving those a bit of a rake over just to get a nice tilt on those and then that's it we're ready for seeding. Okay, so as you can see, uh, excuse the uh, very noisy cows by the way, I think it's feeding time in the field behind us. Um, as you can see behind me now, that is one nicely rotivated site. Fantastic finish that machine gives on the back of the tractor, so it uh, saves a lot of, lot of raking. That's now ready for seeding. Uh, so it's literally just the one, two, three banks to run over with a rake now. And then that's it, we can uh, walk away and come back and seed in a few weeks. So uh, yeah, looking good and the sun's shining, no rain, which is perfect. So there we have it, as you can see, all the banks, the big one behind me, the one to the right, and the smaller one down in this corner have all been hand prepped, which is going to make for a fantastic seed bed for all the wildflower seeds, which will be sown in a few weeks time. And uh, apologies for my slightly dishevelled appearance, it's a very hot afternoon here in Norfolk, so, uh, but I mustn't grumble, it hasn't rained and it's enabled us to crack on with this. A fantastic project which I really can't wait to come back and see next year and the upside is I've just been bought this fabulous homemade juice by the customer which is uh, <laughs> very 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 well received at this time of day. Well, it's now six months later, it's the end of March, or coming up for the end of March, and I'm back at this site. Now, a lot has changed. During the winter months, we had a lot of uh, water that was standing in the middle of the meadow, just the water table is so high around here, and we had so much rain. These dikes overflowed into the main area, and this area held a lot of water, so I was unable to sow 
then in the drain out the wind a little bit. I was unable to then sow in the autumn, which of course is preferable when you're doing these wildflower meadows. Uh, of September, October sowing is always better to allow the seed to break down uh, in the frost and the colder months in uh, you know, through this through the, through the winter if you like, and then into the spring when they'll then uh, pop up and germinate and do their thing. So the main area is going to be sown with a wetland mix, just in case this area floods again. The banks are going to be sown with a tufted hair grass to provide habitat and cover for bank voles and everything else. So food for the owls and kestrels that are on this site and if you can see just above me right up there there is a new and installed kestrel box which is brilliant and there are a pair of resident kestrels around that are hunting in the field behind me uh, which of course you will remember the woodland they have got no shortage of habitat to hunt for voles in so out the wind a little um, you can see the area back there where I started um, it's, it's a little bit greener around the edges where you would expect the fertility to increase and so therefore there are a few thistles and nettles and things you can mow those back over and sort of suppress them a bit if you want to obviously they are still a good vital food source for a lot of insects through the summer you just got to be a little bit mindful of them spreading particularly on open ground like this um, if they go to seed so you can always let them flower then cut the flower heads off if you don't want them to spread the seed so i'm going to go over this lot with a tufted hair grass mix this bank here and these are greener of course because these are where the main body of the turf and the topsoil got pushed to with the bulldozer as you've already seen to create these lovely formations so they're going to be more fertile so they're going to come back quicker with a lot more grasses already there so the central areas are then going to get sown with the wetland mix which is going to be all your wet loving flowers things such as ragged robin purple loose strife cuckoo flower things like that that can cope with damp conditions for a long time uh, they're also the, the meadow is going to be sown with an annual mix so your poppies your corn flowers corn marigold your quintessential english meadow flowers but of course these being annuals are going to provide a good cover crop for the perennials while they get established uh, through the summer months which probably won't show a lot of flower this year it'll be the following year when they really start to come into their own so fingers crossed then I can get uh, the perennials uh, to look good for next year but some will come up this year some will germinate but usually they spend the first year kind of getting their roots down getting their basal florets sorted and putting a lot of energy into growing themselves uh, and then they will turn into some really nice bushy wildflowers of course next year in the next season so on top of that we have the perennial mix uh, so on top of the annuals we have the perennial mix which I've just spoken about which is things like the bird's foot trefoil, lesser knapweed or black knapweed, uh, wild carrot, cowslip, sorrel, lots and lots of wildflowers, 80-20 mix, so 80% wildflowers, 20% uh, sorry 80% grasses 20% wildflowers reason being if you were 100% wildflower uh, so in this it would just cost an absolute arm and a leg because of the process involved in extracting as you can imagine thousands and thousands of wildflower seeds so there's an 80-20 mix going on here so the grasses of course are an integral part of any wildflower meadow they're great for a lot of butterfly and moth species for the larvae the habitat for them uh, to actually feed on through the winter months and to grow as caterpillars also the good habitat for you know just anything to get down and have a bit of shelter in so grass is an absolutely essential part of a meadow so that's why it's an 80 20 mix the wildflowers will of course bush out in time and create a really big uh, clump or clumps big clumps sort of dinner plate clumps when they get going so they're going to look great so we've got the tufted hair grass for the banks which is going to provide good cover all year round that'll never get cut that'll get left as overwintering habitat for foals and as i say for things like the kessels and the barn owls to hunt through the wildflowers which are going to go in the middle uh, which are going to be the perennial wildflowers and the annuals just to create a cover crop for the insects and everything and some color while the perennials are establishing and the wetland mix for the area in the middle should this area flood again so we're just doubling up we're making sure that that's not just going to turn into a bare patch of mud through the summer months so that said i'm going to get on with cutting the meadow enjoy the next few seconds of time lapse of me doing so and then the next time i'll be back here of course will be in the summer months when this is all hopefully in full flower or looking looking pretty good getting part way to being a wildflower meadow which of course is the intention if you want to buy any of these wildflower seeds by the way please go to www.wildyourgarden.com where we have a whole host of wildflowers whether you want to buy just one and a half grams of ragged robin or you want to buy your wetland mixes your pond mixes uh, you want to buy your native wildflower seeds plugs anything like that wildyourgarden.com 
um, please go there now obviously that site is now open and we are selling wildflowers to the public so uh, yes don't worry we have you guys covered for making these areas so So it's about 15 months after I sowed the wildflower seed on this site in Norfolk and I've come back to see just how it's getting on. So we've had one full growing season and we're the beginning of August now. So we're coming towards the end of a second full growing season. So have a look at this. It's absolutely teeming with wildflowers and life. I've got a green wool pecker yaffling away that's been on the mown lawn area which mown lawns actually they do have a lot of benefits so it's a video for another day but let's take a wander through this wildflower meadow shall we and see just exactly what has turned up what survived what's doing well what's thriving what's not but first off star of the show at the moment the wild carrot looking absolutely stunning really is wild carrot obviously a biennial so that means it will have grown the first year last year and then this year is its year so no doubt there'll be a bit of a dearth probably next year there won't be as many wild flowers or wild carrots should i say but i love the the way that these flowers unfold or unfurl you can see just before they come out absolutely fabulous shame it's this time of night because a few moments ago about well half an hour or so ago um, I've been doing some filming with the drone so uh, yeah it really was the sunlight coming through the wildflowers was just absolutely stunning but it's clouded over it now but you can still get the impression it really really is quite a place now and the clients have mown this lovely path through here which I don't know if you've ever seen a more bucolic image than that really just sets it off gives them access to the area so let's have a wander if we like into the middle of the meadow because this area before it was sown, actually just after I finished all the groundworks, was absolutely, well, it was a quagmire. I mean, it was almost like uh, a lake, to be honest. This whole middle area, that's why we've got a slightly different floral diversity, was underwater. In fact, probably, I'd say half to two thirds of the meadow was actually underwater. So I was sort of going through the winter months thinking, oh, when's this gonna dry out? I've got to get it sown for a spring sowing. And then of course, last year we had all the corn, um, the the yellow corn flower not the corn flowers sorry the corn um marigold i'll get there in a moment <laughs> the yellow come up which was an absolute sea of yellow which was great last year whilst all the perennials were establishing but looking now into this area you would never know that this was flooded that this was a different area there's loads of stuff in here we've got things like this uh, common knapweed which is sort of going over now um there's loads and loads of clover on the floor there is some self heal back there some really interesting stuff as well uh, if i can find some my favorite the bird's foot trefoil good old faithful in any meadow really doing very well um where is it there was some a moment ago oh, we've got some uh, you can tell how damp it was we've got some soft rush that's just been cropping up which has uh, been an indicator of this wet ground um, but that's absolutely fine I'm going to have to go back over this side. Oh, we've got some in this area down here. We've got some common fleabane, which is a plant that if you guys have been watching the videos on the channel for a while, you'll, you'll know I plant a lot of around my wildlife ponds that I make. It's a really, really good plant. Self heal, really nice one that's flowering as well. We've got some meadow buttercup, which will have been out earlier on in the year, sort of May, June time. Here we go, this is what I wanted to show you, which is really, really nice. Oh, and I've just seen something else. <laughs> like a treasure trove, this is. This is meadow vetchling. You can see it's slightly different to the bird's foot trefoil in that the, the world, W-H-O-R-L, of flowers on a bird's foot trefoil create a ring, whereas these are more coming off a central stem and it's got more of a rambling habit um meadow vetchling so really nice one and larval food plant for the uh, bonnet moths six spot and the five spot bonnet moths um yes and i've just seen back through here really nice to see again a good indicator of the meadow if you have a look down there that just give it the old sniff test Oh yes, a 100% water mint. So really nice to see that growing in the meadow as well. Um, then if I turn around this way, you can see we've got 
this tufted vetch, which again is just going to seed. You can see these lovely seed pods forming. Classic vetch flower. Tufted vetch, a really nice plant. Again, a rambling habit that comes up through a lot of meadow plants. You can see the soft rush in here doing rather well. There's a few creeping thistle that have come back, but that's fine, you know, we would like a variety of wildflowers in here. You're never going to, you never want to get rid of one species completely. I know creeping thistle can be a bit invasive, can be a bit of a pernicious thug at times, but then you can see these poorer areas, just how sparse the ground is and how little wildflowers are in there. There's still lots there, the things like the white clover flowering. We've got good old bird's foot trefoil, I think that one thing had outlive everything else in an apocalypse but sort of trefoil <laughs> so and then the banks obviously the banks were sown with the same mixtures and with but with more grassy mixtures as well you can see a lot of the creeping thistle because this was the fertile soil that was pushed up off the meadow to make way for all the wildflowers these banks are more fertile so they've got a lot of creeping thistle on them but that's good they're really really good nectar source creeping thistle and if i work my way through to the back so you guys can have a look. I did actually do a video of the family of swans that were coming through here every day when I was making the meadow, which you might remember them kind of waddling through from over there, but it's just an absolute picture. And something that is really creating a wonderful, wonderful habitat for so much wildlife, so many insects the clients have said they've seen through this meadow. And of course, birds such as goldfinches, chaffinches, all sorts of birds will use the seed heads or they'll come down and they'll feed on the seed heads in this meadow but if i just do a slow pan just look at that now it's absolutely gorgeous i'm only slightly envious <laughs> really is brilliant you can see where that wet patch was where there are a few less wildflowers but there's still stuff in there really nice area for wildlife so i'm absolutely blown away with how good this place looks now it really is quite something and it's going to get better year on year on year just because the wildflowers will be developing slowly this is only the second year remember this is only the second full year of growth and of course we've had the heat waves we've had this year we've had 40 degree heat here in the uk so i think this is looking remarkably well you wouldn't you wouldn't tell that we've had 40 degrees because look at the vegetation here look how green it is it's providing the ground with cover and obviously keeping it cooler so meadows are really really positive example of how we can combat climate change global warming and keep our ground cooler which of course is going to keep more heat lower down and into the lower parts of the atmosphere rather than sort of bouncing it back up off baked ground and everything else so mown areas really are going to be something that we need to address if we're going to um, tackle heat increases over the coming years because I think we are seeing more and more of them. Anyway, I digress slightly. But yes, wanted to show you guys the meadow. Really, really chuffed with it. Hope you are enjoying seeing the sights that I'm seeing here. And I will put a link in at the end of this video if you want to create your own wildlife meadow, um, or wildflower meadow, should I say. I've done a video that will help you guys even in a small patch in your back garden. You don't have to have this this site, which is probably half an acre-ish. You don't have to have as much as this to create a wonderful habitat for wildlife. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Please feel free to subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, give the video a like, and I'll be sure to bring you many more videos on all the ways in which you can help wildlife in videos to come. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.